pod sass by putting the sass back in sassy sponsored by leader pro where you can book demos with target customers on demand and fill your sales pipeline instantly Welcome everybody to another episode of PodSass. I'm your host, Chris Shang, and today we have Brian Glick from Chain.io. How's it going, Brian? Uh, it's going great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, awesome. Um, tell us a little bit about Chain and what you guys do, as well as uh, you know who's your target customer looks like. Awesome. Yeah. So we are in the supply chain business, which up until two years ago, I had to really explain what that was. Now we've all, we've all been living with supply chain uh, pain for the last couple of years. Uh, so our job in that space is we do the data plumbing between supply chain companies. So you've got you know, a company that has a ship and another company that's got a truck and they've got to exchange all that data about what's going on. Everyone's got ancient systems and we do the really uninteresting piping that has to happen so that people can actually get packages moved all around the world. Got it. Makes a ton of sense. And so what, uh, so you work with supply chain companies or logistics companies? Yep. So we work with logistics companies. We work with the brands that need product moved and we work with the software companies that support them. So we're the glue between those three parties. So you'll have, you know, a company, you know, like a big parcel company and a big retail store that you might shop at and somebody's got to exchange the data between their software. And so we hop in the middle so that their IT departments don't have to work together because sometimes that's really, really hard to get two different big company IT departments to agree on anything. Got it. And then so you guys are like that glue, but also provide then the visibility or transparency as part of every step of the process from like the manufacturing facility down to the end consumer. Yep. All over that process. So there's uh, one of my favorite stats is in it to get one international shipment from say a factory in China to a, a warehouse in the U S there can be 143 different companies involved. Wow. Uh, and, you know, think about the trucker in China and the trucker in the U S and the customs agencies and the ship owners and the company that just figures out whether the invoices are right. So all of those companies have to connect to us so that we can broker the data amongst all of those. So it's, uh, it's a little bit of a miracle anytime anything gets anywhere on time. <laughs> very cool. Very interesting. Uh, would love to dive into that a little bit more. Um, but before we do that, I want to jump into the series of rapid fire questions just to get to know you again a little bit better as an individual, as a human being. Um, so if you're happy, we can dive right in. Let's do it. All right. Awesome. Uh, first question is pretty straightforward. Favorite entrepreneur and or startup story? It could be either or. So my favorite startup story is actually in 2008 when Dig turned down $200 million from Google. Yeah. Uh, and the reason I love that story is they ended up selling for next to nothing, but that, that shows a conviction, right? To say, no, we, we believe in what we're doing and we believe it has value. And, you know, wh however it turned out, just the, just the, the guts it takes to turn down a $200 million <laughs> check is, is impressive to me. That's awesome. And there's a lot of stories. I mean, there's definitely other stories similar to that, right? Um, but yeah, super, super interesting. Uh, growing up as a kid, like eight, nine, 10 years old, do you remember what you wanted to be? I wanted to be a writer for many, many years. And hmm. before that, I wanted to be an architect. Got it. So. Any any particular category of writing? Uh, modernist poetry, which is a little bit, little bit far away from logistics. <laughs> there's a lot of art though in building a product, right? So there is, like, there's, yeah. there's, um, you know, you get to exercise the same part of your brain, which is just this massive creativity. And once you can see that that doesn't have to be the written word or, or oil paint, you, you can kind of open up that, that same muscle. Absolutely. Uh, most painful experience. And I'll put it into a little bit of context, but the idea is I think, um, the moments, at least for me personally, where I've seen the most amount of personal or professional development or growth has come from the most uncomfortable situations. So has there been anything in your life where you can go back to and be like, that was an inflection point in my life? So many, many years ago, I was working at a company as a first time manager and we brought in this consultant and I went behind her back and just undermined the hell out of her. <laughs> And she walked into my office and it had come back to her and she just sat me down and she's like, look, did you do this and why? And years later she became my boss and now she's one of my best friends. But the fact that she sat down and just completely called me out and I was a hundred percent wrong was, um, that was a really good lesson to get early. 
Uh, and, and then to be able to say, I'm very proud of salvaging that relationship and then turning her into one of my best friends. That's, that's amazing. Um, so building a company, obviously lots of challenges in that, uh, lots of hurdles and walls that you run into. Is there anything that you go to? Uh, it could be the arts. It could be anything just personally that motivates you in the 25th hour. I love win-wins. I love when like we were able to come out of that 25th hour and know that because we're connecting things that people on both sides are going to get value and that like there's going to be somebody smiling at the end. Um, you know, there's kind of this adage about companies that just transfer value from one person to another versus creating new value. And so honestly, what keeps me going is like having done some of the jobs that our customers do and knowing that, okay, if we get this right, like people are going to, like people are going to have that moment of joy in their day because that awful spreadsheet they're dealing with is going to go away. It seems like a little thing, but when you stare at that spreadsheet every day for 20 years and then it's not there anymore, that can feel really good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in those, like, you know, going back to that idea of like being, being backed up against the wall and, and overcoming that, um, it can also, it can also create a lot of stress, right? So is there anything that you personally go to, to decompress from, from stress uh, day to day? I am obsessed with a video game called Football Manager, which is a, it's like spreadsheets as a video game. It's essentially you manage all of the financial ins and outs and coaching of a, of a fictional soccer theme. And it's the most, the most addictive game. And so I will just at night spend unbelievable amounts of time coaching third tier Spanish soccer teams to win the championship which is wow. that, that, that gets enough focus to, to shut my brain off from work. That's awesome. Um, has there been any skill set that you've picked up along the way as a founder and now CEO uh, that you've either loved or hated or just had some strong emotional disposition towards? The skill set that I picked up along the way would have to be the, the ability to understand that there's always a third path, right? And to get people in a room where they see a very A and B situation and go, there are infinite possibilities at any given moment. And so we don't just have to choose A and B. Let's find the, let's find the path. And, and being able to draw that out of people when they come in to a situation in a very defensive way or in a very rigid mindset and say, no, like there's, you can do anything at any moment. There's consequences, but it's up to you. You know, the ability to open people's minds like that is, I think, uh, really fun. Yeah, I agree too. Um, here, the next question is the idea, uh, it's a little bit more personal, but does, is there anything on your bucket list uh, that you find to be somewhat more ambitious than, than others? Um, I, uh, <laughs> I tell our team that our goal is only to be as big as Visa or MasterCard uh as a company so one of my bucket list things is is to have a moment where we are so boring like visa and mastercard that somebody at some company someday walks into their boss like i don't want to use chain io because it's boring there's this new hot startup and the boss just be like, get out of my office uh because everybody just does chain io because it just works and so I want to have that moment. I want to get that phone call. I know that's a professional one. Um, my personal ambitions aren't actually that big. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, unlike a lot of, uh, you know, people I think get into startups for the ego of it, I my life goals are to have a house in Spain and an apartment in Amsterdam and fly coach in between them. And so it's a big goal on the on the grand scale of most people on earth, but it's not like, I don't I don't have to have a bigger yacht than everybody else. Yeah. I love that. I mean, I love the idea of having options, right? Option of. So whether it's, you know, having having that house in Spain and but then just flying coach there, I like the dichotomy of the options of, of both of them, right? Um, the last question here is the idea of legacy. Uh, but more importantly, you know, I think like what, what kind of impact do you want to leave on this world before you leave it? I want people to be happier and more fulfilled because I was here. And I think that you can have you can have impact on 
a lot of people in a very shallow way or on a fewer group of people in a very deep way. And I would choose the latter. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think about, and I know it's cliche to say, I think about my grandfather, but he was, um, he had a standing room funeral because they just couldn't get everybody in, but it was all people from his community who he had helped over the years. Like he just always was out helping people. And to me, that's a measure of a life well lived is that these people show up because you did a lot of small things for them, not because you necessarily, you know, created something out of your own ego. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's super important. Um, and I feel like that's like the richest, richest wealth that you can ever accumulate, right? Is, is that, that kind of an experience. Um, awesome. That's, that's it for the rapid fire questions. And there's a lot of great nuggets in there that I definitely want to expand upon. Um, I think first kind of diving into, you know, how did you make the decision to start chain.io? I was kind of looking at, you know, your LinkedIn profile and, and I know that you have like more of a technical background traditionally. Um, but how did you go from, you know, like a, a steady paycheck to them making the decision uh, into entrepreneurship. I'm always very curious into that story. So this is my second one. Mm-hmm. And this one was maybe a little bit easier. So if I go back to the first company I started, I had uh, I, I got let go from a job that I was very frustrated with. And I had a customer at that job who wanted a product built. And somehow I thought it was a good idea with a one-year-old as a single income earner in my house and like, uh, you know, a relatively modest amount of money in the bank account to call that customer and be like, if I build this thing, will you buy it? And so I bootstrapped the first one just out of nothing. I didn't even know about VC. I didn't know about the startup world. Um, So that one was a little insane. I still, to this day, don't understand how my brain thought that was a reasonable thing to do, but it worked. Uh, This one, on the other hand, I was uh, working in a company and I was I had account management and sales responsibility and I ran IT and I could just see how painful it was. Every time we wanted to get a customer, we had to integrate with them. And it was like the worst part of the job. It was the, my team hated it. Our customers hated it. And we were pretty good at it. I said, I just saw this problem and said, if you can go fix the thing that everyone hates, like nobody like wakes up in the morning and goes, I want to do systems integrations today. It's the thing you have to do because you want to get to something else. And so my brain just told me, it was like, go do the thing that everyone else hates and they'll pay you for it because nobody, like they can go work on more fun stuff. And so I was able to uh, work very closely with the, actually with the uh, owner of that company that I worked with helped fund this one because, and he's actually on our board to this day. Uh, because we both saw this problem and understood that it was a kind of a, a thing worth solving. Mm, very interesting. Um, le- I want to go back a little bit mm-hmm. to your first startup, and then, uh, and then, did you work at another company? You worked at this other company uh, that ultimately helped finance this one, or, or was there like some experience in between there? No. So I sold that company. Which okay. Was, so the company, my first company, was called Aspect Nine. I and see. we sold to a company called Vandegrift that doesn't exist anymore. And it was the owner of Vandegrift and I, uh, so him personally, not that company, mm-hmm. who kind of helped, you know, he helped me start this one. Uh, that was, a, and you know, again, I think culture is always the most important thing. And when I had sold my first company to, to Vandegrift, I signed a three-year earnout, which is pretty common. I stayed for seven years because I just loved the culture in the company there. But I saw this big problem. I was like, mm-hmm. it was just gnawing at me. And I was like, I have to go fix this for our industry because it's broken everywhere. And uh, so it was really one of those, you know, I, th- I think sometimes, especially when you come from an engineering background, you see problems and you're like, I don't have a choice. I have to fix this. Mm. Like, I will not be able to sleep if this problem continues to exist in the world. And so kind of the engineer part of my brain took over and said, you just have to do this. Like you can't, you can't ignore this problem anymore. Yeah. I think that's like a, how a lot of, I mean, I say half the founders end up in that situation that we've interviewed on this podcast has been like that. Um, where it's, it's an organic problem that they dealt with given the domain expertise that they had in that field. Um, and then they went out to go solve that problem and build a business off of it. Um, next question here is, so 
supply chain is and logistics and what you're built is a complicated product, compl- complicated problem, right? Uh, especially again, you're talking about data integration with legacy systems that were not necessarily like built to you know talk to one another. Um, how did you go about solving this problem and and the idea of like when you're looking at building the product, what were the stages that you knew that you had to get to to kind of like prove it out? One, and then two, where you found market fit and you realized, okay, now we can scale this up. So the original thesis was we can build this common API for the industry. Mm. And so this would have been 2017. Uh, And when we went out and we said, if we build an API and it'll have this database and everyone will be able to write their data in a common way, and then they can read it back into different systems. Uh, And when we went out to market with that, which is a really fancy way of saying called a couple of people and asked them if they'd buy it, um, what we found out very quickly was nobody in our industry at that time really knew what an API was nor did anyone have any interest in investing their money into building a connection to something that had no other users on it. We had like the, you know, what's the value of Twitter if there's one user on it is, you know, it's very, very low. Uh, we had that same problem. Uh, so what the, the adjustment or, or pivot that we made is we said, well, what if we built the plugins to other people's software? And instead of getting the industry to agree to work with us, we take that same data model and we just hide it. And what it did was it created a much better alignment with our customers and then sort of all the other stakeholders and said, we'll build to you, we'll build the plugins, first of all, because we know they'll be built right. Uh, and, that, and that was sort of the, sh- the inflection point around 2019 was we we realized we were building a network and but that it was our responsibility to build the network uh, as opposed to asking everyone to come to us. And so that was the huge, that was the huge pivot point in kind of like that was when that, when we made that shift, then suddenly everyone in the industry was happy to work with us because we were making everyone's life easier. And, and, uh, you know, we had understood that we needed to bring value to all parties, but we realized we needed to take it even a step further and just make it very, very easy for everyone to work with us so that they could work with each other more easily. Got it. Um, another question here, because I'm imagining the industry that you're selling into your target, your target ICP is like probably a steeper tech learning curve than other, other categories. How have you guys overcome that? Um, especially when we're trying to displace legacy software or like, or not maybe even displacing, but like, training somebody new on new software, uh, it's always seems to be a pretty heavy lift, uh, at least in the onboarding experience. How have you, how have you guys tackled that? Or, or... It continues to be hard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the way that we've gone about it, uh, which isn't always the most efficient way to do it, is we have a really good client success team. And most of the projects that we work on, almost regardless of the size of the company, feel like enterprise projects. So you don't, you know, we're not a product-led growth like Atlassian style, you know, you're just going to sign up from the website kind of company. We're, we're solving problems where there might be, you know, we're doing one implementation with a customer where the project managers in Vancouver, decision makers in Mexico, headquarters is in Germany. There's four other companies involved. Everyone has their own project managers. Like these things get pretty complex. And so we have to be able to sit at that table with all of those other companies and understand that in a multi-year project, our piece is a very small but important role in a larger problem. Uh, So our client success team has to really engage and build those relationships across that whole thing. So there's no, there's no magic to it, but it is a, if you get that people part right, uh, we don't ask people to write a lot of code. We have our plugins and the actual, the, in the, in the course of, of, let's say there's a hundred points of effort in our integration or in our implementation, probably two points are actually configuring our system and 98 points are helping people test and helping them kind of get through their project management to get all of this working. Got it. Got it. 
Um, so cool. VCs hate that answer, by the way. <laughs> they want to hear, oh, you just turn the switch and it's on. Right? Oh, yeah, it's of course. Bit, but enterprise, <laughs> enterprise technology is not always that simple. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, if you go to Oracle and you go to the Cisco's, I mean, still very much run like that too. So, um, cool. I, you know, I think, uh, I want to go back a little bit more into your, your startup journey and just kind of the experience. Like, uh, you know, you mentioned like your first company and, and then it seemed very organic that this next one came out of the relationships that ended up happening and was created from, from selling that first company. But you know, what has there been moments either in the first startup or this one where you like second guessed yourself or like felt like, you know, imposter syndrome is a common thing that we, we talk about here too, but like um, dealt with any of those, those, those moments and how did you tackle it or, or overcome every it? Every hour of every day for the last 30 years, I've been dealing with that. So yes, no, there's no, um, there's no getting around. I mean, I'll tell you last week I, I had meetings with some relatively senior federal officials who were asking me some pretty in-depth questions about supply chain problems and trying to develop national policy based on my answers. And I'm like, I'm the college dropout who's just kind of started a couple of, co like, I, I know that I know these things, but like, it just seems complete. It seems like that should involve people who I don't know are fictionally like way smarter than me um so yeah though I have that imposter syndrome today and and I would say if if anything I've learned that if you strong if you take a clear position on things people appreciate it and if you're wrong people will be very forgiving and frankly most of the time they'll forget about it anyway uh and so just um uh, like my advice to first-time managers even more than people who are doing startups is make decisions don't be afraid to make decisions and, and most people are afraid to do it in the first place so if you make a lot of decisions and a few of them are right your batting average is going to take care of itself um, whereas most people are just afraid to take the swings in the first place that's a very good point i mean i feel like yeah i mean i feel like that's a that's I mean, that's one, uh, the reason why I think a lot of people kind of don't make jumps or makes leaps into something that they're super passionate about. But secondarily, I think like to, it is just one of those things that uh, people struggle with and it makes it makes for less efficiency use of their time, right? It's like, you're going to drag your feet. You're going to have to make a decision at some point anyways. And if you go back into that mindset of how you just explained it, I feel like it can help people shortcut a little bit faster and just get to pulling the trigger sooner than later. And I think people also really overestimate the consequences of most of the decisions they make. Very, very few things beyond pulling the trigger of a gun, uh, mm -hmm. like can't be undone. Mm -hmm. Right. So Absolutely. take a shot, make a decision, try something. If it doesn't work, you fix it. Yeah. Right. Like it's, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, those of us who have been successful in startups, generally get successful by making tons and tons of mistakes very rapidly um and more the often than not i'm wrong i won't I just admit that yeah no i i, I agree and i think uh but that's I, I and this is more maybe a philosophical question for you but um that mindset is just it's it's not the majority right like a majority is afraid of failure afraid of rejection and making mistakes. Um, and so they play it very safe it, for you. When did that realization kick in? Was there any like moment as, I don't know if this is maybe goes back to your childhood or I don't know, like an experience that you have that, that maybe it's that manager and that turned into your best friend kind of experience. I don't know, but, uh, anything that you can kind of go back to where you feel like that switched for you. So my, parents were divorced and I was at my father's house and I got in a lot of trouble because I did, I never did my homework and I always lied about it. And he was really mad. My report card had come and, and it was like the cows, the, the chickens had come home to roost situation. And I remember calling my mother at her house and I was just like in a panic. And I thought I was like maybe 13. I was like, oh, the world's going to end. And she, she says to me, she goes, is the sun going to come up tomorrow? And I'm like, yeah. She goes, okay. So let's have a little bit of perspective. Like the, the world is not going to end that. I use that 
all the time with people that are all worked up on something and this is the consequences and I just and I just will repeat that she said that to me I just feel like okay is the way I'd like to say it is is your decision going to cause the earth to crash into the sun mm. if not then it's not the worst thing that could happen and we can now now let's place it on a spectrum from nothing to that and you'll find that it's really much closer to nothing than that um and and so i remember her saying that to me and it was just very very impactful and i always kind of come back to that when i get anxiety about decision making is is the earth going to crash into the sun and if not then you're somewhere else on the spectrum and you can kind of then level sit yourself that's that's amazing uh, that's uh yeah, you have a great mom. I mean, <laughs> what can I say? Like, that's a great way to kind of, I mean, you know, she didn't get mad at you. She didn't get upset about the report card. And she gave oh, she you was some... mad at me. She, oh, just, oh, knew, okay. she just knew which, <laughs> which, which lever to push at that given moment. <laughs> got it, me. got it. <laughs> she didn't let me off that easy, but she, you know, she knew that I had to pull it back for a second. <laughs> got so, it, got it, got it. Okay, so you you must have, like, been really panicky and kind yeah, of like... If, in she, the, if, she, yeah. if she heard this and I had said that she wasn't mad at me, I'd be getting in trouble now. <laughs> so, <laughs> Fair enough. Um, very cool. So I'm going to end it on, on just one more question here. Uh, but it's the idea of, you know, where do you see Chain.io in the next five years? Um, I know you had mentioned the idea and the comparison of like the Visa MasterCard place. Uh, do you see... Do you see yourself there in the next five years or do you see yourself like really kind of like hitting your stride with everything that you guys are, are building um, to get to that trajectory of, of, of that Im image that you that you set out? So so we have a ways to go. Yeah. Um, you know, we were just lucky enough to raise our Series A uh, and um, what it means right now is we are going to continue to have this very open tent for all of the software companies and all of the different partners in the supply chain to join. Uh, right now, we're very focused on sort of international transportation, which is a subset of that. And over the next few years, we'll be expanding into more things in warehousing and trucking and, and all of these things. So we'll continue to grow that tent. Um, and as long as I don't, I don't believe in making really big predictions because Again, as a startup person, I know I'm usually wrong. So we're going to continue to grow that tent at the pace that is sustainable and that helps our customers. We, you know, we're building a very long-term sustainable network here. Uh, networks do grow exponentially at some point, so that feels really good. But um, in the meantime, we're just going to continue to make people's lives easier in, in our industry. On that note... Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, it was great to hear your story and your journey. Um, and again, the goal from, from this podcast is really, you know, maybe somebody else listening in where they feel like there's a part of your journey that you went through that they see in, in their reflection and maybe it can help push them or give them that motivation to, to take the leap into doing something that they really are passionate about. Yeah, and I'm always always available, LinkedIn, Twitter, where anybody wants to find me, one-on-one -on -one conversations. I love to mentor and help. So if anybody awesome. wants help, reach out. All right, and we'll share that. Thank you so much. Thank you.